I'll talk the, through a, a, some of the threats uh, that we're seeing, um, and I'm going to put them broadly in three categories, uh, and, and they, they cross in a number of ways. The, the key issues, I say, are free expression and privacy and the right to organise. Those are your key issues, and then due process as well. These are the sort of big things. And the threats are broadly from corporate um, angles and from government angles. And this, again, poses a big question for people on the left because people on the centre-left tend to think that if there's a problem with corporate power, you deal with it through government action. And in this space, that isn't necessarily a particularly good approach because the government itself is a big threat in and of itself. So, starting with corporate uh, questions, i uh, talk about a little bit about corporate censorship. Um, and I'm just going to say there are maybe three or four areas here of corporate censorship we're currently seeing. There's obviously things like Facebook takedowns, uh, corporate policies which are too strict. Uh, and this is a difficult area because these are private networks and you know, how do you get private networks to behave you know, in a public interest sort of fashion is difficult. Um, we see this extended particularly uh, at the moment with uh, mobile phones. Um, we've got a campaign running at the moment to get people to report uh, censor censorship on, on mobile phones. Um, when you buy a phone, nobody tells you, but it's censored. Did you know that? I did. You did. So, did the rest of you know? Some of you do. Some yeah. of you don't. So, what happens is that the mobile companies um, take the view that when you get a phone, it might be given to a child. And because it may be given to a child, they are going to block what they call adult material. <coughs> adult material means anything that's caught in their filter. It doesn't mean it's pornography. It means it might have a swear word in it. So we found a church based in Sheffield, censored. We found um, La Quadratura de Net, a social movement like Org, blocked by Orange, ironically enough, being as they're both French. Um, we found a couple of political blogs in the last couple of days. <coughs> um, people like you, actually. Um, we found uh, bars routinely censored as well, because they're providers of alcohol. People who are under 18 shouldn't be getting alcohol. <coughs> Presumably they might drink it on their mobile phone. <laughs> uh, so, uh, they're blocked. So, this sort of censorship, you can remove if you're over 18. You have to do things like take your passport to the um, phone shop, or you can give them your credit card details, which, you know, to be honest, on a mobile phone is a fairly inconvenient thing. Um, and some of them are slightly better with the methods that you can, can uh, remove the censorship. But, nevertheless, it's a difficult thing. The guy who had the church, uh, his site, you know, the church site blocked. He uh, was so incensed, he ring, rang up this customer services and said, what's going on here? Can you please remove the block? And they said, uh, well, we've done, no idea how to do that. Uh, we don't understand really what, what, how to do that. So, but what we can do is remove the adult block for you. And he said, that, that's not what I asked him. So I want you to enter me on a list of people who want pornography. I said, I wanted you to take my site off your blocking list. Uh, However, this is what they did. So he got a, mo a little message on his phone. He said, "You are now in adult content is now enabled on your mobile device," which his wife spotted, and uh, you know to explain why to his wife why he wanted to look at pornography on his mobile phone. So you can imagine that there are you know significant barriers even there where you've got a reasonable reason for perhaps making sure that children do get some protection. The fact is that these companies are not worried about damage to us and our websites. They haven't worried about the inconvenience to website owners who might be in France or the States um, and how difficult it's going to be for them to find out that their sites are being blocked. They've just done it. Um, and I think that shows a level of irresponsibility actually towards our rights that corporate censorship uh, often uh, involves. I could give other examples including the way that the Internet Watch Foundation who block child pornography work. You know, they again they managed to disrupt Wikipedia for a week or two through again through essentially insensitive mechanisms. This is the sort of thing we campaign on. At the moment we're particularly on the mobile stuff, we're really pushing for people to tell us about it. We then feed that back to the mobile operators and that forces them to talk to us and hopefully that then causes some change. Um, next 
big thing on the corporate side is sort of corporate surveillance. And we're working particularly here, I'll mention a few of the things that you think of with corporate surveillance. Uh, social networks is a big one. Uh, social networks, what's going on there? Uh, you're being surveilled. You're, you're be why are you being surveilled? Because you are not really their customer. You are their product. <coughs> they, the, the, the customer for Facebook is an advertiser. Uh, you, are, your data and access to you is being sold to their customers, the advertisers. Mm -hmm. So in that, you want to just think about that. If on Facebook, you are rather like a farm animal. You're the product. You're being, your data is being farmed for somebody else. <coughs> um, so yes, so, so there's some, some real interesting things there around the risks uh, of that data being potentially handed over to governments, uh, certainly um, around organisation and so on, if your material gets deleted, the lack of rights you have, um, and so on. Um, and also, you know, just around, as I say, around, around the whole question of being profiled and whether we're comfortable with that and the power that advertisers get to us, you know, in, in relation to the data that is being held. I think an interesting one again here is a question of workplace surveillance. Um, apparently, quite you know, quite an everyday issue for TUC. Um, uh, some you know, some, some TOC members, you know, some of their unions are constantly having to battle and in, in trade, you know, in, in workplaces around questions like being tagged with RFIDs or you know having the times that you go to the toilet monitored, you know, or your phone calls monitored, or, you know, some really pretty disgusting and demeaning habits going on by people who can't manage people and prefer to do it in an automatic fashion rather than treating us like human beings. And again, that perhaps is one of the big dangers with digital technologies in general. Um, the other one I think just to mention quickly is behavioural advertising, something we're doing an awful lot on. Um, I'm involved in uh, discussions at W3C talking about do not track. Um, to give you a bit of context here, when you visit, say, The Guardian, a respectable website, you look at the number of people who get your data <coughs> Um, as a result of adverts coming off third-party networks and being served to you and cookies being placed to help see what sites you visit across the web. There's maybe six or eight companies that receive your data. It isn't just The Guardian that ends up knowing about you as a result of visiting their website. It's about six odd advertisers who then are able to sort of see what you do on these websites, build a profile of your activities, understand what sort of adverts you might want. And you are not asked for your consent. You're never asked about this, it just happens. Now, everyone except the advertisers thinks that this is an outrage. The European Union thinks it's an outrage. The Federal Trade Commission in the States think it's unacceptable. The browser manufacturers don't like it either because they want to have some protection for their users. And this is what's forced the web consortium, the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, to try to look at ways to protect users. I don't want to go too much into the internet aspect because I think it would be a bit much, but just to say, this is another area where Open Rights Group is making a particular effort because we want to help shape those, those changes to make sure that we really protect user privacy in the future. Um, but I'm going to quickly move on to government because I, 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 I could go on for a very long time but I'm not careful. Uh, government, uh, our governments, um, it's looking again at surveillance and censorship, we start off with government censorship because it's a particular problem at the moment. First thing I note with government is that there isn't a lot of official censorship on the web at the moment the, um, in the UK. There's like partic one particular example which is copyright censorship which happens through the courts where sites like Newsbin are being blocked. Um, and you know that, that's, that's maybe a danger but it's uh, not the worst of it right at this point. What governments are doing instead is they're hiding behind the corporations. What they're doing is they say, we don't really want to be bothered with all this censorship and having to police it and take it through courses on. So you, the companies, you have your social responsibility. Uh, you are, you can, you're capable of what they call self-regulation. Why don't you go and self-regulate <coughs> the content? So they say to ISPs, um, started off with uh, child pornography uh, with the IWF saying, you invent a scheme to block this stuff. Um, it's now moving into spheres like uh, terrorism. Uh, under the Prevent Strategy, the, um, the government and in fact now the Commons have issued reports saying we want the companies to unilaterally censor material. 
Uh, no, they don't want them to go through the courts. They do want a government-approved list, which they will build themselves without reference to the courts. Uh, but people will voluntarily, that's to say companies will voluntarily self-regulate and censor this material for us. This, you know, this is fundamentally unacceptable behaviour. This is about governments pushing censorship into the realm of private mechanisms which citizens have no control over. Um, it's very, very bad. And there are a few other examples, I won't go into too many of them. The other big question with government, obviously, is surveillance. Now, you probably don't feel on the net that you're being surveilled by the government, but you sort of are. The big change happened a few years ago with what they call data retention. So uh, the European Union, um, well, Tony Blair, actually, Tony Blair, one of his genius moments, sort of went to... Uh, went to Europe and said, we've been bombed in Britain, we've been bombed in Spain, it's time that we surveil everybody. It, we keep all the data about everybody's net uh, communications, the emails they send, these, uh, the, the web addresses that they visit. Uh, we, wanna, we want that data retained by internet service providers for in every European country for at least three, but up to two or three so years. Um, and they persuaded the European Union to do that. And, and, and so now, in the UK and across most European countries, this happens. This is a big shift because, uh, you know, you go back a couple of decades, and it was possible for somebody in, in the police to say, right, okay, um, we want your data. Or well, we want somebody's data. We will get this telephone bill or whatever of somebody. They would have to go to the telephone company and say, "We know you've got these records. You've collected it for your business purposes. That's fair enough. Now we want access to it because we're worried about this person." Now what the government says is, "You collect this data from um, individuals. We want you to keep it for longer than you need in case we might have access to it." in the future. That's to say, we're going to presume the whole population is potentially guilty for two years. Um, and you're going to you keep these records going to be kept because of that. And they want to take a shift further, actually, now. Um, and and there, was a, there was a Labour plan called Intercept Modernisation, which has been sort of on the back burner <coughs> in the Conservative and Liberal government. Um, and this plan is all about uh, sort of Instead of just collecting data that you, they do in business purposes and forcing them to keep it, you know, as I say, like the emails you send or the, the um, internet addresses that you might visit, they now want the ISPs to collect all of your Facebook messaging, the instant messaging that you might do, um, chat rooms that you visit. They want to keep everything about who you talk to in any context they possibly can. That's their plan. Um, it's, it used to be called internet um, modernisation, it's now uh, intercept modernisation, it's now being called communications capabilities development programme. <laughs> Sounds very innocuous, doesn't it? It doesn't sound like it's any major <laughs> problem, but you know what it is. Um, so this sort of bureaucratic little thing, um, that the idea is that they, 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 they push the ISPs now to collect data that's of no use to them, that's only of use to law enforcement, um, on the basis, again, that we as a population, someone in it might be guilty. This, you know, this is not good privacy. This is not good human rights balance. The idea of human rights is you, you have a suspect. I suspect, you know, I'm the government. I suspect Mishma of being a terrorist. Then what do I do? I decide to get her surveilled. I don't surveil all you just because you might have contact with Mishma. But that's the way the government's dealing with it. It's just saying, well... <laughs> <laughs> well, indeed, I mean, you know, it's obviously completely deliberate in that context, because uh, that is what they do. So, uh, you know, that's, that's still, you know, it's like um, we're all guilty until we're found guilty or something. Yeah. Um, so there we go, that's, that's where that's at. Um, I'll try and be brief now, because I'm taking quick, quite a long time. I'll, I'll try and be wrap up fairly quickly. So, next big thing um, that, that drives a lot of this is a very specific corporate interest, which is copyright. Copyright industries are, they have a legitimate claim. They have rights in material that they produce, like films or movies or whatever. There's a legitimate 
can say that they want to monetize that and be able to uh, determine the rates at which uh, it's paid for. Um, however, what they don't have a, a right to do um, is to force everybody else to enforce their rights and to cause lots of damage to other people in the process. But this is their strategy. It's a strategy of control. Because they have copyright, they want control over it at all points. So in Belgium, they've been pushing to actually compel internet service providers to monitor everybody's traffic, to spy on everybody in case their files might be being shared by their customers. Now, thankfully, the European courts have just said, you can't do that. You cannot force companies or internet service providers to generally monitor their customers or citizens, but that has been the strategy of the copyright holders in that instance, and if, they, if the European courts had failed to enforce that right, we'd all be under surveillance pretty damn quick, um, because that's one of the things that's open to copyright holders. Um, there's also things like ACTA, which are currently going on, uh, which again is about sort of encouraging, so to speak, um, internet service providers to work to get users cut off or whatever they might do. Um, so, you know, often the point about these things isn't that copyright is illegitimate, it's about the means of enforcement to turn out to be quite illegitimate. Um, but because these interests are very powerful, copyright owners are very skilled lobbyists, they've been doing it for, frankly, since, you know, the 20s, they've got an extremely good track record of getting their stuff through all kinds of parliaments and, and international fora. They, they just expect to be able to solve their problems through legal mechanisms. They're not worried about the effect overall on innovation or on our free speech or our ability to communicate. They just push and because it's their commercial interest. And governments find it very difficult because copyright industries are things like broadcasters. They're the people who put the news out. They're the people who have musicians who uh, help politicians look slightly cooler than they might do otherwise in during elections. You know, this is, so this makes them powerful, you know, makes them, gives them huge social currency for politicians, particularly older politicians who are less used to the sort of decentralized, essentially uh, talk way that we now shape opinion. Uh, you know, they're not used to that sort of network effect of opinion, they're used to a sort of broadcast top-down sort of messaging, and the copyright holders are the ones with that sort of power. So, to wrap up, and I, I think Loz is going to talk a bit about this as well, so I'll try not to cover the, the ground too much, but um, what I've painted must sound a fairly bleak sort of picture. I sometimes wonder when, when you talk about these things, like, you know, you're going to just frighten people into thinking, there is no hope, right? There is no hope, it's all doom, <laughs> right? Um, and I'm just going to set that sort of straight a little bit, because there is hope, and it sort of comes in a couple of forms. Firstly, we have tremendous public consciousness now, actually, about the power that we have through the net. People understand the benefits, particularly younger people, who really, really know. And, and uh, they're dependent on the net for all kinds of things, through their social lives, through their political organisation, and that means they're willing to defend it. And I think that's why you see things like this, a huge outrage over ACTA, a trade treaty that looked quite dull and boring and no one had paid any attention to for the two or, or not so much attention to for several years. And then at the point where it became very obvious that, that, that um, the American actions uh, SOPA in the USA and um, ACTA now in Europe you know, were connected and this was part of a pattern of companies trying to essentially censor the internet and take control over it and take that power away from us citizens. It caused outrage and it's meant huge movements in a number of countries, significantly Poland and Germany. And it's really, you know, it's involved the pirate parties as well as groups like Panopticon and Open Rights Group and the uh, Project of Dunet. Um, and and it's, it's really, you know, so the civil society as well as the political side, if you like, of this equation. And it's just really crystallised the idea that, uh, you know, we must defend this because it's important to us and it's shown <coughs> politicians that this is actually an issue on the street. Well, one of the things I'm going to just say here today I think is that that politicisation has not happened in the UK to quite the same extent. It sort of did in the Digital Economy Act, I think it had the same effect, but um, for one reason or another I don't think that um, perhaps 
has had quite the sort of level of, you know, hasn't had the impact on the politicians in the way that it had on people on the ground in the UK. So I think while people are interested in these issues, and, and that was actually a lot of people, you know, it meant that things like the, the first question that David Cameron got asked on YouTube was, would he repeal the Digital Economy Act? You know, that's a result of that huge wave of public consciousness in that, in that point. Um, but it didn't actually quite figure with him. They actually haven't quite realised this to the extent that they could. Um, so just go a little bit further, one tiny last point. When we try to evaluate all this and try to think how we deal with these issues um, and what is it that, that, that's important, um, I would just go to a simple idea. You've got to think about what the public good is here. You, know, the, you have the private good. I want my copyrights enforced. I want my right to surveil my customers. Um, I want the right to choose what content gets put on my network or whatever. That's your private rights of mobile companies, Facebook, um, and so on. Those private rights, or, or film, music, and so on, those industries, and copyrights, on, those private rights are one argument. Um, then there's a government argument, uh, you know, what's good for government, surveillance citizens, and so on. And then you have a question about the public good, which is, you know, do these people have a reason for having a copyright? Do they have a reasonable reason for enforcing it in a particular way? Does the government have a right to surveil us or not? And that public good question is the one that we have to use to evaluate what's actually being proposed and to sort of say actually no. Where does the public right balance, where does the public good come from? I think it has to be rooted in our rights. You know, if we don't want to be just sheep and people, you know, surveilled, um, corralled, censored um, on the whim of governments or corporations, if we don't want that to be the case, then we have to go back to our fundamental rights and we have to say, are they protected? Are we getting sufficient protection for those rights and are we able to enforce our rights? Um, is information flowing freely? Does that fuel economic growth? Does it allow the spread of ideas? Um, do we have a right to privacy or are we living in a surveillance state? Um, is our right to free expression guaranteed or is it uh, cur curtailed? Is our freedom of religion and our ability to organise, are these things protected or not? And if we're able to sort of go back to those fundamental rights and, and evaluate what's being said from that point of view and to remember that this is about power in our hands, not theirs, and I think it's very clear what we have to do, and I think it's very easy for very large numbers of people to understand what it is we have to do. Um, your role, I think, and which is what we should discuss a bit, I think your role is very much about really discussing these issues and really getting everybody else to realise that they're important. Because Open Rights Group can't do it alone. Pirate Party can't do it alone. This is about citizens taking action themselves and explaining to other citizens that this is important. You know, whoever, whoever leads, you know, the actor thing was not led by org or by the pirate party. The actor protests were led by people who were inspired by the action that people were taking in Poland. They were taking to the streets there and they wanted to take to the streets in the UK. That's the right way for social change to happen and we must encourage it. So.